There he is. Come on then, how did it go? Oh man. Oh, I was just saying to Aaron, so it was it was a bit of a roller coaster, if I'm honest. The temptation was so strong early on to be like, screw this, I'm ripping off the I'm ripping off the, the masking tape. What if I told you there was a way to race a marathon or a half marathon and feel totally in control from start to finish? A way to cut your risk of going out too hard, blowing up and ending up riding the struggle bus home. A way to run as strong in the final miles as you did in the first. Interested? Well, so are we. And that's why we've been on a mission to find out if getting your eyes off your watch, ditching pacing bands and pacing plans to race entirely on feel might just be the best way to bag yourself a new PB. So I wrote in Danny from the Big Run podcast and we guinea pigged ourselves and embraced the concept of racing entirely on feel. We covered our watches and we ran naked, thankfully not literally, but free from the pressure of data, no splits, no heart rate, no clocks, and definitely no running power readouts. We've also spoken to expert coaches and a running anthropologist to dive deeper into the science, the pros and cons of running on feel. We'll help you understand if you should do it, how to do it, and when to do it. Plus discover if lab rat number one Danny, a self-confessed slave to his watch, can be convinced to ditch it ahead of his marathon PB attempt in Valencia. Welcome to the Man V Miles Big Run Podcast Race on Feel Experiment. Well, it's kind of Christmas Eve for our half marathon run on feel attempt, but I think this might be a good opportunity to kind of roll back a little bit, give some people a little bit of context as to where this idea has come from, your kind of uh, experiments with it so far, and how you roped me into this experiment. Where this came from, I obviously over the summer went away and did um, a small plod along the Danube and did, you know, did my 67 marathons in 67 days, and all of that running was done very low and slow, really low heart rate, really easy, not really any kind of, you know, looking at a watch, not really worried, just, it's all sort of just getting from A to B intact, really, was what it was all about. And then when I came home, what I realized really quite quickly was that I probably built the biggest kind of aerobic base that I've ever built in my entire life. And I wanted to see, I felt good at the end of the run, I wanted to see uh, how I would perform over a marathon with all of that work done but no specific marathon targeted training so I hadn't done any intervals I hadn't done any fast work I hadn't done any kind of marathon pace running and I just wanted to see you know can you run fast without running fast so I signed up for the New Forest Marathon and I decided to run it rather than kind of set myself an arbitrary time because I hadn't really trained for a target time with a coach or anything I just thought you know what I'll I'll cover my watches and I'm just going to go and run this how my body allows me to run it and that's where the experiment started so I went and did that on a very sort of difficult course really it's quite kind of it's it's a little bit of trail a little bit of road there's lots of hills it was quite windy you know the conditions were the kind of conditions that would sort of test you um in terms of sort of running on on sort of a straight kind of pace run or running on heart rate and so running on feel I thought this would be great I've run that course also sort of three or four times before so it was a good kind of benchmark I'd go back and see and actually I ran a 310 for the marathon it was my fastest time on that course and, and quite a quick time. But the one thing that was really surprising for me was I ran entirely in control from start to finish. And this is a race that I've run before and been hanging quite a lot towards the end because I've got it wrong in terms of the pace. It was fascinating to me to finally do this race and feel by the end, like I was still in control. I was moving well and I'd done it all just based on how I felt in the moment. When I looked at my splits, I ran pretty much even splits as well and probably one of the most even paced marathons that I'd run. Then I went to the Royal Parks half and I thought, well, I'll follow this up and see if I can do this again over a half marathon. I just, you know, it felt like a great fun way to run. And I ended up doing a 127 at the Royal Parks half, which is, I think, my third fastest half marathon ever. Again, didn't look at the watch once. I think I ran pretty much even splits there and felt in control, overtaking people towards the end, all the things that you sort of are nice in those kind of races. And then finally, I went to do the Abingdon marathon sort of a month after that. I ran a 301 there, which was my third fastest marathon ever. My PB is a 257. And I, for the first time, I think, ever in my life, I ran negative splits and I ran it all on feel in that race no one overtook me i i was just i'd moved sort of steadily from the start but throughout the whole race i was overtaking people and that kind of momentum feeling was excellent and it got me thinking well if i if, if i've managed to run this way and feel so positive about it without looking at the watch and having my kind of most enjoyable less kind of struggle bussy best runs 
will this work for other people? And then you DM'd me. <laughs> and this is where we are. It's, I mean, an extraordinary kind of series of, of experiments with incredible success. And I think I saw them and I think I was really curious and inspired because it's a, a version of a type of runner that I've always wanted to be is someone that um, isn't buried in the data, isn't looking for validation. And I saw, you know, what you'd done and just thought, I, I, I want to try this. But I'm just curious though, with, with you and um, your relationship to data, I mean, because you've been running and testing for, for quite a long time. Was there a period, have you ever been a runner that was... Um, that never never recorded any of your runs or is this something that you've only just sort of started to experiment with no i mean this is this is new for me i mean my kind of love of running my discovery of running coincided with the advent of wearable technology you know the first early sort of gps watches the first pedometers all of these things so you know that was part of the lure for me really was actually testing kit and looking at the sort of the data alongside my running often when you first start out racing i think that's something that you you go to because you need guidance you know you want something to tell you am i how well am i doing am i getting better am i seeing progress this is a new thing for me as well it's and it's been a bit of a revelation i mean i'm because of my job i'm often you know i'm wearing two watches right now i've you know when we go and do this half marathon i will have a lot of watches on they'll just be covered i'll also be wearing probably a couple of chest straps and you know so my whole life i've been running has really been sort of quite heavily data driven i, I guess one area that sort of starts to drag you away from that is when you go beyond marathon and maybe into ultra running where some of the runs it doesn't if you do a hundred miler it doesn't necessarily really matter what's going on you just need to keep moving and yeah this starts to sort of maybe make you think that there is another way of doing it even just in the sort of past two weeks where i've kind of been sort of almost trying to train myself in in running on feel with recovery runs with some long runs and sometimes recently this week in fact where my watch has actually died on me midway through a track session where i've, where I've literally been forced to run on feel i've actually started to realize that I, and I'm not, I don't think this, the whole kind of outline of this is about saying watches are evil, we should never ever use them. Because I think there's there is absolutely um, times when you, you should be looking to use that data, but it's really made me think about my relationship to it and also seeing it as well as a yardstick, sometimes maybe a bit of a crutch as well. Sh should we should we kind of give an overview about what the kind of the control test is is for me? So this is we're recording this on Friday, so Friday the the eleventh of November. So on on Saturday, the twelfth of November, we're heading down to Battersea Park to do a half marathon. And, and what are you going to make me do, Kieran? I think the context is you've got a half, you've got a full marathon coming up in Valencia in how many weeks? We're probably just under a month now. In our, arguably, this is quite a kind of key moment in your kind of training cycle. And you've got a race that you're going to go and use your watch and probably use this race as a guide as to how well you're going to get on in Valencia and, you know, try and set yourself, give yourself a bit of confidence, run well, maybe, maybe go hunting fast times and, you know, so you go into Valencia on top form. I'm going to challenge you to go out, cover your watch. We're going to be wearing the gear, so we're going to be tracking all of the data. It's not about not having the data. The data is very important. But I'm going to challenge you to go out and run from start to finish just based on the way that you feel and see what time you get. If you've never run on field before and raced on field, what are the what are the you know the challenges, what are the good bits and I'm really intrigued to see at the end of the race your reaction to it, how you how you enjoy it, whether you hate it, you know, is this going to be a moment where you do change your relationship with the watch? There's a part of me that really wants you to love it so much that you then decide, actually, when I get to Valencia, do you know what? I'm going to do this again. It's interesting because I've been talking to my coach a little bit about this, and I, I would say she's a big advocate for running on field. She said, and I quote, I blooming hate heart rate, but the blooming was a was a slightly different word um, because she said, I know, I know that you're running well at the moment. I know you're fit, but... <laughs> I'm scared to let go, Kieran. Any tips? Because I've never, I've never, ever, ever run a race blind. In that start, I mean, even when you're wearing a watch, and even though you might have a sort of set of a pacing strategy, marathons and half marathons, it's so easy to just bust that pacing strategy. Lots of people do it. I've done it hundreds of times where you, you know, well, I feel great. So I'm going to run 10 seconds faster. I'm going to bank some time and that'll be great for the second half of the marathon. My experience, it never, ever works. <laughs> you, you always pay it back at later on. You know, you're basically just making a debt. And this is the same. It's no different. You have to judge it well in those first three miles for sure. And that's 
you know, for those first three miles, really focusing in, really feeling, really asking yourself intense questions. How does my heart feel? How does my how do my legs feel? How's my breathing? Am I running at a pace that I think I can consistently maintain for the whole half marathon in a very honest way? You want to be like a caged kind of animal, really. That you're you're waiting for that moment that someone's going to say, "Okay, now I can hit the hit the the accelerator and go and sort of squeeze." So you want to feel contained, I think, in almost uncomfortably contained. You're almost like sort of a bit jittery. Like I've got more. I know I've got more. That's what you want to be telling yourself. I'm in control. And I know I've got more for that first kind of three miles. So I split the race up. I get to three miles in control. Set, that's where I'm settling in. I'm getting used to it. And then at kind of six miles, I ask myself the question: you know, Am I, you know, sensible, steady, controlled? Am I in control? How does this feel again? Am I, you know, am I, am I running? in a way that I know is still sustainable. And, you know, you sort of ask yourself the same questions over again when you get to six. And then a little bit later on, I think once you get to kind of nine or 10 miles, this is where I've, in, in the, when I did it, I start to sort of say to myself, okay, now I feel good. I'm hopefully passing people. And now I'm looking, right, how, how much more can I squeeze now? And that's when I start to just, you know, put the accelerator down a little bit. Not too much. You don't want to be sort of going crazy. It's not like you're doing the last mile and you're turning around that last corner and sort of sprinting. But you can start to squeeze it up. And if you squeeze it up gradually, you start to pass people. You get the momentum. You get the, that feeling of you're in control and you're running well and other people are struggling. So, you know, it's horrible for them, but it's very positive for you <laughs> as you sort of go past them. And it's 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 kind of self-reinforcing. It's such, it's such a better way to be than the other thing happening when you run too fast and you're just holding on in the last three and people are coming past you one thing i am worried about though is 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 getting to the end of the race seeing the time and 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 slightly undercooking it is that something to be concerned about this again will come with experience i think of doing this and i think certainly you know maybe in my half marathon maybe i had a little bit more i could have given but i think this isn't about it's not about not pushing your limits it is about pushing your limits it's it's about measuring and trying to get kind of you sort of trying to ride that kind of line just under the limits and my advice to you if you it's really when you get into that last chunk of the race let's say sort of maybe three or four miles or even you know and if you feel you know the the, the positive here is if you get to that point and you go actually I, f- I feel like i've got so much more here you can still you can still earn that time right <laughs> you know all of a sudden you're doing you're going to do a fast 5k a really fast 5k and that can earn you back the time maybe that you might have undercooked it. But I think it's what you're doing is you're kind of stacking that really good feeling and, and to the end rather than sort of using it up in the beginning. At some point, you're going to go and dig deep, squeeze that trigger and, and you're going to be, you know, it's going to hurt the same as it, it does. But you're going to, I think you're going to feel like a controlled misery rather than, you know, rather than the proper struggle bus that we've all been on sometimes in marathons. Controlled misery and suffering. I think, I think, yeah, I I feel like that is, I mean, that's kind of a perfect analogy for like perfect running, isn't it? Like a perfectly executed race is, is sort of uh, tempered and controlled and sustained suffering executed, uh, executed in the perfect way. Okay. I think that's, that's a good thing to sort of remind myself of. um, And hopefully I I am in that place sort of coming mile nine sort of 10 when it's time to to switch it up a gear and start start picking people off well um yeah we're less than what yeah less than 24 hours out so uh yeah i suppose i'll uh, i suppose i'll see you uh, bright and early tomorrow morning uh, at batsy park My name's Johnny Woodhouse, I'm Head of Ops at Run Through. It's because of the, the minimal elevation around the course, like although it is eight and three quarter laps, there is, there's no hills, it's flat, you have the chance to accelerate as you go around all of the stretches. It's a great course for someone looking or hunting for a PB. I think it's important to understand your body and know when you can run on fill, because essentially, worst case scenario, if you didn't have a watch or anything like that, in a training run, for instance, if you know how your body's going to react to a certain uh, course or a certain distance or uh, a certain kind of profile of a race, then, then you understand that you have a greater understanding of your own body. Race morning, I think we were about 
yeah, we're an hour before, so mm -hmm. we're here really early, Kido's, Super just to build up early. the nerves, <laughs> <laughs> just to get in tune with our feelings before we go and run. Daddy, how are you? How are you feeling? Uh, I'm fe I mean, I I definitely was nervous this morning. It was funny actually. I was recording a little bit this morning, uh, walking to the station to come into Battersea today, and I looked at my watch to check the time, and it was like, well, I'm not going to be looking at you again later. It was like almost saying goodbye to my watch. It's starting to build. I'm starting to feel a bit nervous. Can, can you just just for context for everyone mm. watching? What's your current half marathon PB? So my current half marathon PB, which was actually set here um, back in January of, of 2022, is one hour, 20 minutes and 50 seconds. Which is fast. You're not just coming into this fret, you know, without training. You're actually in the midst of a marathon training program. Yeah, so just explain how fit you're feeling at the moment. Uh, hopefully I'm feeling fit. Um, there's been obviously a bit, you know, a bit of cold, some COVID as well thrown into that along the way, which has slightly derailed it sometimes, but yeah, I mean, if I'm not fit now, there's there's nothing more to be gained, so. So there's every chance you can go and run a good race. I'm not thinking about digits and numbers today. Like I feel like it's got to be more kind of uh, emotive kind of language of like effort and, and feel and, you know, listening to my breathing, listening to my heartbeat, you know, just listening to my body. And like, like we were talking about earlier yesterday, just, um, starting that dialogue early on and being as honest with myself as possible. I'm not feeling great this morning, I'm pretty tired, but I, my fastest half is a 122. I've recently run a 127. I don't have any idea what I'm gonna to get today at all. All I know is I'm gonna get, I think I'm gonna get the race I deserve. Let's go do it, shall we? I guess we should just go and run the race. Any final, any final tips before we start? Anything One final tip is just be calm and listen, really tune in. Mm -hmm. As much as possible, check in, check in, check in frequently throughout the race. Okay, okay, wish me luck. Let's go do it. Danny went blasting out at the start. Don't know, he left me for dust, so to be interested whether he's got that bit of feel, very bit right. This loop course is an amazing one to run through because there's mile markers everywhere and uh, you've got to count the laps, but literally don't really know how far I've run. So this is it, then we're in the final lap, about two miles to go. Time to see what's left. So that's it, done. The run through half, and I come through, I think my watch says 129. So roughly that, not my fastest ever, not my slowest ever, was a bit of a struggle. And the running on field experiment was, was interesting. Here he is. Come on then, how did it go? Oh man, oh, I was just saying to Aaron, so it was, it was a bit of a roller coaster, if I'm honest. Um, I, I re the temptation was so strong early on to be like, screw this, I'm ripping off the, I'm ripping off the, the masking tape. Um, I, fa I still found it quite difficult. Um, so scores on the door, which is probably what you want to yeah, know. Yeah, come on, hit us. Hit us. It, it wasn't a PB. Okay. It was 123. Okay. 123 high. Um, and I would say like, I, I think mentally, mentally not knowing, what I'd banked early on in terms of seeing the numbers made me feel unsure about how I could push it at the end. But then the argument is, is I should feel that. Do you know what I mean? I should be able to feel that. But coming across the line now, I felt like I had a lot more in me. So if anything, I was listening to my body. It gives me confidence in a, in a way that my legs don't feel trashed at all. Um, and I've still done a 123. So that's, that's confidence building for Valencia. It was a really, really interesting experience like did you feel in control the whole way i did i did like i think i think mile eight into nine the the devil got on my shoulder a little bit um felt a little bit nauseous when i was trying to force down a gel um, and that sort of discombobulated me but the loop thing was interesting because you start to write little stories in your head because you haven't got that data so it's like 
get that guy in there, get that guy in that club vest, or you know, pull that other guy in, or you know, someone's coming up behind me, but it's fine, I can chase them down at the end. So maybe not the time you want. One thing I was interested in as I was out there, I got 129. Mm -hmm. So again, not my quickest, not my slowest. Mm -hmm. Pretty much the same, I found like mile eight and nine, found a bit tough. That was when mm -hmm. I had to sort of dig in mm -hmm. a bit more than I have done in the past. One thing I found a bit difficult on this course was that because I didn't follow or count the mile markers, you lo did you lose I yourself? Lose, I lost track of where I was. I didn't know how many miles I'd done because you're seeing like seven and then six and then nine and then eight and then 11 yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're not really sure which lap or where you are. So yeah. you've, in the other races where you've got the mile markers are anchor points, mm. that was also gone here. And I think that may be- I definitely so lost I, my place. I didn't have that. You know those those, those bullet points I talked about, three, mm. six, nine, mm. they mm. were kind of gone. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that didn't help, but- And I could feel because obviously this watch was still running with the with the tape underneath. I could feel the bzz, the vibrate yeah. of each mile marker, but it was coming at irregular times that wasn't yeah. correlating to the markers on the course. Yeah. And that was like, so like mile, I think mile five, mile six was where I really was like, am I on seven miles or six miles? And I really wanted to rip that off because I found it really, it was like, I'm freaking out here a little bit. But um, as for running Valencia blind, <laughs> No. What we're going to do, I think we're going to go back into the studio. There isn't a studio. We're going back in somewhere inside where we're not at the end of the race. And we're going to look at some of the data, see what the heart rate chest strap could attract, how, the, how our intensity worked. And maybe we'll throw some of those numbers over to the coaches as well and see what they make of it, mm. how well we ran. Yeah, see if I could have tried that. See what the splits were. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's, we'll go and have a look because my arm's aching. <laughs> I think as a subject, it's something I come across all the time. Um, so I'm regularly having discussions with athletes, particularly um, athletes who are very data driven. So they're looking at their GPS, whether it's their Garmin, Polar, whatever it's going to be. And they're extrapolating data all the time. And, and of course, I'm guilty sometimes of asking them to send me links and looking at the data because from a training point of view, it can sometimes tell us quite a lot, particularly if some of you coaching or a lot of your coaching is done remotely sometimes and a lot of runs, you know, I'm not beside people all the time there when, when they're running, even if I see them a few times a week. There's a lot that we can look at that's really, really useful, whether it's, you know, are you hitting your marathon pace? Were you running at threshold based on perhaps your lab data or all the data you've created that means you know you're in the right threshold zone and were you really in it? How stable were you in it? There's so many good things with data that's out there, but racing's not about data. And it never has been. And this is where I'm a bit of an old fart as well, because I genuinely raced in that generation. And there were generations before me, definitely, where we didn't have the technology. So you had to run to feel. And you might have your Casio on your arm that you looked at a mile marker at the side of the road, but the mile markers were tied to the nearest bit of street furniture, so weren't accurate. And you probably didn't really always know the pace you were running at. It wasn't relevant. You were racing the pack around you, whether you were in the front pack, mid pack, whatever it's going to be. And you cross the line and then look to your watch or there might be a race clock. You looked at it and sometimes you were like, wow, I can't believe I've run that. And sometimes you'd look at it and think, oh, I thought I'd be quicker today. What's happened though is you've taken away, I think, some of the very things that create a full ceiling for people. And that is their data and running to an exact pace all the way, for many people isn't actually something that's inspiring. It becomes something that's mentally really tiring and um, something that can almost force you every kilometer to have yet another discussion with uh, the chimp on your shoulder or the gremlin, whatever it is about where you are, how's it going, how do you feel when you're constantly then reviewing everything rather than running free and just enjoying that run um, and in the old days because we didn't have the data I think we were very much more tuned into what I would call pure racing so um, we were focused on trying to stick with the vest in front or beat the person from the local club um, or catch the group in front or stay ahead of the group behind we were into pure racing and doing the best we could probably based on the way we felt and then the things that were around us. We honestly didn't often know what the time um, aspect was and what our splits were like. And you got better and better at your perceived rate of exertion, I think, as a result of it. And I think one of the things that technology has created in recent years is a misunderstanding of 
actually the most important element, which is your perceived rate of exertion and you running how you feel and understanding what that really is. And then also taking away the glass ceiling and in a race, actually to run a PB, you've got to be prepared to run faster than you've ever run before and believe you can do that, but without overanalyzing it every kilometer. For a, a pretty experienced runner, and, and you guys are, the half marathon is almost the perfect threshold run that just keeps going. And gradually towards the end, you're actually really squeezing it harder and harder and coming home inside or harder than threshold if you've really got it right. But it's almost the, the best threshold run you've done that goes through the threshold zone and you hold it and hold it and then you squeeze it later on. OK, that's when you really get it right. Now, you can do that off the rate of perceived exertion and it can go really, really well without the worry of the splits. But from a data point of view, you're probably going to see a really good average pace. And then you would hopefully see, if you really get it right, those paces picking up rather than dropping off slightly towards the end. So it's kind of the, the world of maybe negative splits. From a heart rate point of view, the heart gets tired. It's a muscle. So you, you should see a nice, reasonably straight line with the heart rate. But you're probably going to see it slightly trend up throughout because the body's getting hard, uh, tired. So you're going to see that that gradual increase but any increase should be very gradual and the ability to hold it for a long time should be good but what you really want in a half marathon is is to get to seven eight miles knowing you're working well and kind of in that i'm running my best threshold run ever here but i just feel like i can keep going and you just want to be focusing on that group ahead of you and keeping going in that threshold zone and then it suddenly becomes five six seven k to go and then you're going to start to squeeze it a bit more squeeze it a bit more and with 5K to go, it becomes a 5K race. Then it becomes a 3K race, and you're charging it the best you can all the way home. You don't want to get to 10K and a half marathon and feel like you've just run a 10K. Because if you do, there's only one thing you're going to do in the second half, and that's slow down dramatically and pay that oxygen debt back. And that's horrible. That's when a half marathon is like one of the worst distances ever. So a lot of people love half marathons because it's almost like their best ever threshold run that keeps going. That race you've just done, what I would have said to you was, why don't you do the first couple of kilometers or the first mile? And yeah, have a look. Have a look and just see whether you're roughly on what you should be, just a bit outside, just a bit inside, and just adjust accordingly a little bit after that first mile or first 2K. But then after that first mile or first 2K, turn it around the other way. And then focus on what's around you. Focus on the group you're in, people ahead, what you feel like, remind yourself what you feel like, start to break the race down into chunks, into, you know, quarters or whatever, and focus then on that bit you're in and getting that right, then focus on the next bit. But at the same time, you're not going to get away from me, I'm going to stick with you. Someone comes past you, they're entitled to come past you. That's okay. It's not the end of the world. It doesn't mean you're having a bad run, because someone overtakes you. I get this all the time, you know, I tightened up, I person came past me it's all gone wrong no it hasn't that's racing because you're going to go past people too so relax stick to what you're doing if you feel good you might go with them or you might see them later on anyway if they're that good you're not going to see them get over it <laughs> run for you okay and run to your strengths so you gradually learn through racing and racing more often i think to get better at um coping with all of that but some people get very much more nervous than others so they've they've got to listen to music read before they do things warm up with other people or have a system they've got to get rid of the the gremlin or the chimp that's chattering away at them and they've got to put things in place some people are, are better at getting through that but data if you've gone out and you've said right i'm going to run four minute kilometers all the way around today in my 10k and i'm going to try and break 40 minutes or run 40 minutes if you feel really good, you're probably going to run that, okay? But who knows? Was that the day you could have run 37 minutes? And that's my question. Racing is pure. So I think you look at the first kilometer, just check your roughly there, then get on with the race. Lots of good things can happen without restrictions. You've not put a ceiling in place. No one knows how good you can really be. But if you ask me to summarize, I would say, look, with your recovery runs, your easy runs, sometimes don't worry about your watch, just just completely run to feel. Um, really, really, you know, sometimes don't even take your watch with you. I mean, it's a good thing. Uh, your threshold running, learn to what it should feel like always through a forward answer effort, control discomfort. 
but roughly make sure you're in the right zones or whatever. So you, you need to check that. Don't worry about paces. Racing over 5K, 10K, half marathon, learn to race to feel and learn to race without splits because if you can do that i think you really will surprise yourself particularly if you've been very data driven before in the marathon i do think you need some data each mile or kilometer just to make sure you're you're on target and so on but even then don't obsess with it, it it's it's just something that's a very useful tool because it's you versus the distance but but without doubt perceived exertion is the most important metric out of all of the ones that are out there. All of the others are just assisting us with a bit more information, but perceived rate exertion should be the main governor. From all the interviews I've done with sort of professional athletes, where, you know, whether that's Ethiopians or I've done quite a lot of interviews with like top American distance runners, and most of the people, or pretty much everyone I've spoken to has said that they don't wear these things all the time. That like a lot of the guys I spoke to about um, about whoop and devices similar to that is that they get taken off two or three days before a race because you don't want the negative. You know, if you've slept, if you're not slept great, you don't want to know. There's nothing you can do about that with two days to go before a race. So, um, I get. I think most of the people who are operating at a really high level are using these things quite selectively and really thinking about it. Uh, I had a conversation with Charlie Spedding the other day because he lives in Durham, and I said, you know, I, I showed him all these things, and I was like, well, you know, if these things were available in the '80s, would you have used them? I, I thought maybe he would say, no, no, you don't need any of that stuff, and he didn't. He said, yes, I would have used them. I'd have used the heart rate monitor every now and again, but I wouldn't have worn it all the time. I'd have worn it for very specific runs to find out a specific thing, and then I'd have parked it for a bit and gone back to running on feel for easy runs. I guess the the main thing that anthropologists and sociologists have said about these kinds of devices is that they, they've they been sort of designed to react to a kind of a, a, an anxiety that we seem to have about not knowing, not having enough information about our own bodies or about our own sort of selves. Um, and that I guess that in some cases they address those anxieties and they help us to feel a sort of greater sense of mastery or control over what we're doing and um and, and our lives and things but in other cases they actually make just make that anxiety worse <laughs> that you know that we're presented with all this data we don't really know how to interpret it we don't know necessarily exactly what um yeah what to do with it how we should change our behavior um and so there's this kind of ambivalent relationship with the data i guess of of whether it and it depends on the person it depends on the situation context and things but often these things actually kind of make us more anxious use up our time uh change our relationship with the sports that we're doing or the activities that we're doing in ways that can be quite negative sometimes in ethiopia what i what i found was that you know elite long distance runners who didn't have access to any of these things until um about 2015 when i was out there and then they started using gps watches what i found was that they didn't just unquestioningly adopt those uh, watches and wear them all the time and become kind of um, slaves to the data. But what they did was they adopted them very selectively for particular runs um, where they really wanted specific information. So on kind of tempo runs on flat road surfaces, they would use them. Uh, I've written a paper for, um, for the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute, which basically is about this kind of selective use and the fact that they didn't they rejected using them in sort of more forest running, which was designed to be kind of rejuvenative, more creative kind of form of easy running. The The idea with that is just to to trace this kind of Ethiopian form of expertise around these things, which is to say that, yeah, these things are useful, but we shouldn't use them all the time, basically. The way that they measure themselves is against other people in their training group, basically. So they, you know, they've grown up with particular people in the training camps and things. They normally then move to Addis Ababa, join a professional group, and they're running with the same kind of people. And so for them, it's not necessarily, you know, what their watch is telling them or, or what um, any other kind of self-tracking device would be telling them. It would be like, how am I doing against this guy that I've been competing with, you know, several times a week for the last 10 years, basically. So then, Danny, I guess we're sort of reaching a point where we might have a conclusion of our experiment, a little mini experiment about running on feel. I guess my big question for you to start with really is, how did you enjoy it? And are you going to ditch the watch for Valencia? I think I'm going to hold on to the watch for now. 
but I think I'm going to have a slightly different relationship with it for the marathon. I think what this experiment has taught me is it's kind of been quite eye opening actually in terms of what my relationship to data is and what my relationship to my watch is. And it's actually made me reflect on, um, on things that perhaps I need to sort of develop and, and work on. I think I really enjoyed the fact that this was kind of a mini experiment because it really forced me to kind of commit to the test. Um, there were times during the race where I wasn't enjoying it, where I really wanted to rip off the the tape and see where I, where I was so that I had a, I don't know, a, a sense of place, a, a sort of anchor in terms of where I was in terms of my performance. Um, but I, I enjoy the fact that now, once Valencia is done, I'm going to have a different focus. I'm going to have something new that I can develop on. And, you know, running is, you know, in, in its simplest terms, is something very pure and very simple. And sometimes there is a, a tendency to perhaps not fall out of love with it, but maybe, you know, get a bit bit tired and a bit kind of, a bit sort of bored with it. And I think what this has given me going forward is, okay, this is something else that I can now explore. I can really get in tune with this idea of RP and feel. Um, and what is that going to sort of bring me as a runner going forward? Like what kind of paths is it going to take me down? So I think, I have enjoyed it. I didn't necessarily enjoy it during the race, but I think uh, as an overall experience, it's been a real eye opener and something I'm really keen to explore in in more detail and, and really develop that sort of string to my running bow. Brilliant. And then I, I, I guess, you know, it's the same for me. I think it just opens up, a, it's opened up a different kind of window, a different way of thinking about my runs, a different way of enjoying my runs, setting a different challenge in my runs even, you know, and it's not even... You know, I'll certainly sort of race on the watch again, but there'll be lots more times when I'll I'll use running on feel. And I think for me, the one time when it comes into its its own, it's sort of most useful, most valuable, is if you're in a in a B race, not your goal race, and you're thinking, I don't really know what I'm going to get today. Uh, I don't really know if my training's gone right. I'm not really sure how I feel. I'm not really sure if I can handle this heat or the hills or the or the trail or whatever it is that's out there. Um, and I don't really know how to adjust some of those other sort of metrics accordingly. And there's a real joy in just covering the watch and going and running and accepting, well, I'm going to just see what I get. It's, um, there's a real liberation for it is, is what I've taken from my kind of little mini experiment. And I, I, I think it's been a real eye-opener and, uh, and something that I'm looking forward to, to doing more of just because I've really enjoyed those runs, you know, and that's what we're all, that's what we're all here for. Right. I mean, you know, <laughs> A hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's got to, it's got to be enjoyable, and I think, I think there is potentially for for myself personally a way to sort of chase that that joy and that liberation, and almost sort of surreptitiously let that bleed over into race day. Because I think for me, a big part of it, and it was quite telling on Saturday as well, is the sort of the the level of uh, stress and nerves it prompted by taking away something I've been so used to and I feel like going forward kind of once Valencia's out of the way that you know rocking up to those B races C races whatever you want to call them with just a sense of just ah, let's just see what happens let's let's have fun that that could be developed improved upon that maybe I could almost get myself into a mental state that when I do toe the line be it another marathon or another half um, I can kind of adopt that mentality to carry it over and execute it in a race where I do have a bit more skin in the game. And I'm, I'm excited to, to go down that path and, and follow that journey and yeah, and see, maybe we'll, we'll rendezvous at another half marathon sort of next year and, uh, and see, see if there's a, see if I've improved. So that's kind of concluded our experiment about running on Phil. We have got this video, you might've watched it already, but there is loads, loads more content, deeper dives in with kind of our experts and more of us in conversation about this experiment over on the Big Run podcast. Danny, where can people find their way to that content? Any major podcast provider, Apple, Spotify, you name it. If you just type in the Big Run on any of those providers, then you'll you'll find the podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Perfect. Thank you, Danny. That's been our experiment. Hope you've enjoyed watching it. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe, ring the bell. You'll hear about other videos that are coming up on the channel soon. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk to you about the subject. More experiments like this hopefully coming soon.